you know, in 1989, I was a college senior and had been very focused as a public policy major and just concerned college student um, on this issue of educational inequity, just the fact that where kids are born in our country really determines their educational prospects and, in turn, life prospects. Um, now, at the time, our generation was known as the me generation. Supposedly, we all just wanted to go work on Wall Street and make a lot of money. And I just thought that that label was completely misplaced. I felt like I was one of thousands of graduating seniors out there who were just searching for something that they weren't finding in terms of a way to make a real difference in the world. Um, and I thought the problem wasn't the generation, the problem was the recruiters. And you know, one day this kind of you know, concern about the quality of education, particularly in urban and rural areas, uh, and, and all of that came together, and I just thought, you know what, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our highest poverty communities as we were being recruited at the time to commit two years to work on Wall Street? Um, and I quickly became just completely obsessed with this idea. Um, just with, you know, the notion that, you know, to channel the energy of our country's you know, certainly among the most promising future leaders in our country um, into classrooms in our most under-resourced communities, just the thought of the potential impact of that for, for kids growing up today. And at the same time, you know, the potential long-term impact, like what would that do to the priorities, the consciousness of our country to have our future leaders have their first kind of you know, experience right out of college in those influential years be teaching in high poverty communities instead of working on Wall Street. So I, I just became obsessed, needed a thesis topic, decided to propose this in my thesis, um, and became all the more determined through that process that this just had to happen and that the time was now. I, I've had an extraordinary asset, which was my inexperience and absolute naivete. And um, so a few months later, I turned in a this thesis, which included a plan for actually creating this core. Um, I had this notion that this needed to start on a significant scale in order to communicate a sense of urgency and a sense of national importance. Um, you know, when President Kennedy started the Peace Corps, he asked Sergeant Shriver to come up with a plan to start it. Um, and Sergeant Shriver decided that it had to start with no fewer and no more than 500 core members, like that that was the lowest possible number to communicate a sense of national importance that would attract, you know, our best and brightest, and at the same time that anything bigger would be unmanageable. So that became my number, and I turned in this thesis saying that, uh, you know, and, and I, I think today is about kind of fundraising and development and whatnot, so I'm sort of going into the details of this, but in this plan, um, I said, you know, our budget for the first year would be two and a half million dollars. So my thesis advisor gets this, this thesis, and um, he actually liked the idea, uh, which he hadn't previously thought he, he would like, um, but he thought this was nuts. So he calls me into his office and says, do you know how hard it is to raise $2,500, let alone $2.5 million? And, you know, given my extraordinary asset of inexperience, I said, no, but I think Ross Perot is going to fund this because, um, I mean, of course, I didn't know Ross Perot, but <laughs> I had grown up in Dallas, and um, I knew that he was a real champion for education reform in Texas and that he was an entrepreneur, and I just thought he would love this idea. Um, so at any rate, uh, I, I then wrote letters to corporate executives who were um, kind of quoted in an article in Fortune magazine about how corporate America was committed to education reform, plus some other CEOs who I just threw in for good measure, like the CEO of Delta Airlines and Coca-Cola and stuff like that. Anyway, believe it or not, I got seven meetings off, off of this letter. I think massively enabled by, really the timing was so perfect. There, there was a lot of energy in corporate America about the need to improve education and address this problem. But it was before there was actually a lot of initiative to make it happen, like they just had a big summit about it and whatnot. And so I actually got a few meetings um, and, and one of these executives made a seed grant and another uh, gave me a donated office in, in Manhattan. So I was able to spend the first summer after I graduated meeting as many people as would agree to meet with me, which was, of course, not very many people. Um, 
because what credibility did I have? I would send 100 letters and get two responses and go meet with those two people. But one thing would lead to another. And by the end of the summer, I had actually met quite a number of people in the kind of funding community, in the education reform community, in districts across the country, just trying to test this idea and, and trying to build support for it. And everywhere I went, people said, this is a great idea. It will never work. The reason they thought it wouldn't work is because they thought college students wouldn't want to do this. Um, and I mean, that was the one thing I had any reason to have conviction about. Um, so the plan became to show them that college students would want to do this with the idea being that then everything else would come together. So I worked together with a group of other recent grads. Um, we spread the word on 100 college campuses. Um, no email at the time, so we were putting flyers under doors. And 2,500 people responded within four months, um, which led to a New York Times article, which one thing led to another. Um, and it, it led to, you know, we reached out to the teacher education and uh, kind of teaching community and, in fact, had literally hundreds and hundreds of people saying, we want to be part of the effort to train these folks. School districts across the country agreed to hire them. Um, they still couldn't get over the idea that folks from these colleges actually wanted to teach and wanted to teach in their most understaffed schools. Um, and so all had come together except the two and a half million dollars. Um, and I was at this point quite desperate. It was about April of the year kind of after I'd graduated. We had 500 people who were ready to come into this. We had people committed to train them. We had a university committed to house an eight-week training program and districts committed to hire these folks. And this was about to become very, very embarrassing. We had raised maybe $400,000 um, when a friend of mine, or not a friend, a staff person, you know, uh, down our donated office yells out, Wendy Ross Perot is on the phone. I'm thinking, everyone knows I'm trying to get to him. This is definitely a friend with some sort of prank. <laughs> yes. And sure enough, it's Ross Perot. Because of course, no one would ever, we know it's Ross Perot, got the accent going and everything. Mm -hmm. And he agreed to meet with me. And believe it or not, <laughs> I, I, I wish I could be this persistent today. But I formed a mental image in my head before I went into this meeting. I mean, at this point, I'd met with many, many people. and. Most people I would meet would say, this is great. You need to go talk to X or Y or Z. And at this point, this really was quite a desperate situation. And I, I painted a mental image in my head of me glued to the chair in his office and said to myself, I will not leave his office until he gives us a million dollars. And um, two hours later, <laughs> I left his office with a commitment to a challenge grant of $500,000, which we would have to match three times in order to get his $500,000. Anyway, um, that was all we needed. It kind of catalyzed us to our big goal for the first year. So a year after I graduated, I was looking out on an auditorium full of 489 of the first Teach for America core members who were headed into training and, and ultimately into teaching in, in six urban and rural communities across the country. Um, that was really the beginning of what became an immense learning curve and an immense, immense journey. Um, and, you know, at some level, I mean, Teach for America has progressed far beyond having gone through massive programmatic and organizational and kind of financial learning curves and all sorts of, of ups and downs. Um, this year, 50,000 people applied to Teach for America. Uh, more than 15% of the seniors at, at Harvard and Princeton and Yale are applying. 25 to 30% of the seniors at Spellman apply each year. Um, we are attracting such a diverse, talented group of people. And, and really, this is one of the most sought after things to do a, across the country. Um, we will have 9,000 some teachers in the midst of their two years across 15 urban and rural communities, or not 15, 43 urban and rural communities across the country this, this year. Um, our biggest site is the Mississippi Delta. We have 600 some core members in some of the most remote rural parts of Mississippi and, and Arkansas. 
Um, but about 80% of our teachers are in urban areas, and as I'm sure many of you know, uh, one of our newer sites is here in, in Boston, where we have about, um, I think, a, hundred, a couple hundred teachers in, in, the, in the greater region. Um, at the same time, the kind of long-term impact, and, and you know, um, studies would show that, and, and there's a quite a significant body of research out there about how our teachers do during those two years. Um, and they do have a positive impact on their students' achievement based on the most rigorous third-party studies as it relates to other beginning teachers. And in some grade levels and subject areas, even as it relates to other experienced teachers in, in their schools. Um, and at the same time, I mean, you know, the principal, uh, probably our greatest allies in the world are principals who, you know, love the energy and motivation and commitment and, and just, uh, you know, dedication that our core members bring to, to their work. I mean, they're the kind of people who just throw themselves in. They want to be teaching the kids who face the greatest challenges and they are willing to go way above traditional expectations to meet their extra needs and help move them ahead. As we know, it is very, very challenging and we've learned a lot and continue to learn a lot more about what it takes to, to train and, and support these folks to set them up for, for success with their kids. At the same time, that experience is for them completely transformational. Um, one out of 10 or so of our folks come in thinking that they'll teach, you know, that they would have gone into teaching if it weren't for Teach for America. And yet, out of 24,000 alumni, people who've finished their two years, 65% have jobs that, you know, full-time in education. Half of them as teachers and the other half as school principals. We have 600 school principals across the country, almost all of whom are working in, in low-income communities. Um, many others working in districts. We even have a growing number of, um, kind of district leaders, the superintendents in Newark and Washington, D.C. And, and New Orleans are Teach for America alums and, and many others who are in, in various other roles in and outside of education working to improve the quality of education in, in our urban and rural areas. Um, of the folks who've left education, about half of them have jobs that relate in some way to schools or low-income communities. Maybe they went into medicine, but they're working on, on kind of public health issues in, in urban areas or um, they're in law but working to take on these issues from, from a different perspective. Um, and, and I think what's most heartening is to see what is happening in communities where we've been placing a critical mass of folks for, um, for some time. Because there's something, there's something very different happening in those communities. And for, for sure, it's, it's for many reasons. And as we all know, you know, there's a lot of activity in the broader education reform effort. But if you took out the Teach for America alums, in, in many places you would take away a lot of the kind of entrepreneurial energy and, and leadership in, 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 the, in, in the effort. Um, I, just, I just wrote a, a book called A Chance to Make History, which I think you all have, um, but assume you haven't like fully read. And I, I thought I would just share um, kind of the high level you know, the reason I wrote the book was to try to communicate what I feel like I've learned from our teachers, our alumni, other colleagues we work with in urban and rural communities across the country. Um, I have, you know, come to believe that we could actually solve this problem, meaning like we could ensure that all kids in our country have the chance to attain an excellent education. Um, and you know have various beliefs about what it will take if we're really going to get there and so that's why i wrote a chance to make history and i thought i would just share like the big themes of that and then maybe we can open it up and have a real discussion um uh the book takes its title from one of our teachers who, who finished her two years about a year ago in the bronx her name's megan um she walked into her classes. She had four classes of ninth graders, 112 ninth graders in the Bronx. And she walked in to her students in the first week or so and said to them, this is your chance to make history. And she called upon her students. So her students were coming into her room significantly behind where you know they should have been. 20% um, of them were reading more than three years behind you know, grade level. Uh, they, 75% of them were living below the poverty line. Almost all of them were learning English as a second language. They'd had very little exposure to science. She's supposed to be teaching them biology. 
She calls upon them to take and pass the New York State Regents exam in biology. This is an optional test. Kids opt into it. The assumption is you do that if you're on a college track. Schools don't really want their kids to take the test if they're not going to pass because that'll generate low pass rates. Um, so most kids in the Bronx do not take this test and, and pass it. Um, but she says to them, 100% of you are going to take and pass this test. Um, and her theory was that if they did that, it really would have the chance to, to, to change their trajectory, that um, she would convince her kids that they are college material, like they should be on a college track. They're in ninth grade. It's going to influence their course selection thereafter. It's going to convince other people that they have the potential to be on a college track. Um, so she then threw herself into this goal. And of course, this is an exceedingly ambitious goal. And you know she had to do quite a lot to have any chance of, of reaching it. She rewrote the whole curriculum because, of course, you know the curriculum she was given was not going to meet her kids where they were and get them to that goal. Um, and you know she's the kind of teacher where if you sat in the back of the room, you felt I mean it was like stunning in terms of the sense of urgency. And I mean this is a teacher on a mission to move from one point to another um, and maximizing every second of the day. She very quickly realized she didn't have enough time with her kids, so she got them to come early and stay late. She had three quarters of them coming to school every Saturday. Um, she had them on a mission to get to this goal, um, like literally convinced them if they worked hard enough, they would get there and that it would make a difference in their lives. A year in, um, 112 of her kids had passed this test. And they did so with an average passing rate, nine percentage points higher than, than New York City's average. Um, now, I take a few things from her example. And, and no doubt, as, as principals who, who, who work in this context, you see this every day as well. You know, one, she's showing us clearly this is a solvable problem. You know, we all know. I mean, when we meet kids who do face extra challenges, with extra supports and high expectations, they excel, and excel on an absolute scale. So she's showing us what's possible. Her example shows us, too, that this is not about magic charisma. I mean, I wish she were standing here, because she's not, you know, I mean, there's such an assumption out there in the world that people are born to teach or not, and that it's a product of some sort of magic charisma. No, I mean, what she shows us is there's nothing elusive or magic about this. This is about um, sort of all the basics. I mean, we think about teaching successfully in this context as, as being an act of leadership. You know, she came in and said, here's where we're going. She got a bunch of people to work incredibly hard with her on that mission. She was very goal-oriented and absolutely relentless. Like, so she, sh I mean, there's a lot that's really heartening in her example. Like, this is possible. There's nothing elusive about it. There's a lot that's daunting, I think, in her example as well. Like, after sitting in her room for a morning, I walked up to her and just like my gut feel like off the top comment to her was, where did you come from? <laughs> because in all of this time, I have met precious few Megans. And you know, there's something very daunting when you actually get to know the Megans of the world and understand what they've put into this. And, and you just sort of realize the answer to this problem is not a million Megans. Sadly, we can't have a million Megans, certainly not who do this not just for two years, but every year. Um, and so, so that's a little bit de depressing. But um, the, the encouraging thing is that what we've also seen, and no doubt many of you are a part of over the last 20 years, is the propagation of whole schools that operate differently and as a result make it never easy but easier and more sustainable for talented committed teachers but not absolute superheroes um, to attain the kind of results that, that Megan uh, attained. Um, you know, and, and I know these schools well because many of our alums are kind of all over them as school leaders and, and teachers and, and, and whatnot. And so I've spent a lot of time in these schools. Um, and, and I know you have many of them here in the Boston area. Uh, in a chance to make history, I kind of share the stories of some of them, both traditional schools inside the regular 
you know, public school system and, and charter schools, also public schools, but, but, but outside of some of the constraints of the public schools. Schools like, like I think about a school in Newark, New Jersey, um, called North Star Elementary, where you walk down the hall, I mean, I have elementary kids of my, my own who are going to, you know, a public school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, diverse, et cetera, progressive, viewed as a very good school. You walk down the school of, in, out down the hall in the school in Newark, which is serving a very low income student population, um, you know, where literally the work on the walls is, it, to me it's shocking. Like knowing my own kids work, to see any kindergartner, first grader producing work like that, I just, it's hard for me to even get there. Like the thought that my own kids could produce that kind of work is, is like shocking. And I say that just to say that this is not even about a relative bar. These, there are schools in our country serving the highest need student population, populations producing work that is like better than the best of them. The test results in this school back it up. I mean, their kids are on average at the 93rd percentile in, in the state of New Jersey. Um, I mean, they are producing like kindergartners with written work in both English and Spanish, you know, like beautiful, you know, for kinder, and not even just for kindergartners, like incredible. All of their kids are reading by the end of kindergarten. I'm like, really? All of them? All of them. Um, and, and not just elementary schools, but, you know, there's a school uh, up in Harlem called Kip Infinity, um, which, you know, takes middle schoolers in, you know, fifth graders who are about the, the second or third grade level in performance, and by eighth grade, you know, they're some of the highest performing eighth graders in the whole city. So these are schools that, that I would call, like, Megan was a transformational teacher, like a teacher who helped her kids get on a different trajectory. These are whole schools that are taking whole buildings full of kids and showing us, you know, we can provide a transformational education for kids. And when you really spend time in these schools, and again, I feel like I'm like <laughs> preaching to the people who know more than I about this, but what has been striking to me is, again, that there's nothing elusive about what differentiates these schools. They embrace a different mission than most schools embrace. Like they determine not just to put learning opportunities in front of kids and assume that some will do really, really well and some pretty well and others okay. They, they, they embrace the mission of we are going to put our kids on a different trajectory. We are going to ensure that our kids attain a level of academic strength and character strength necessary to have the chance to get to and through college. This is such an ambitious goal that they go after it with a level of energy and discipline that anyone would go after any various, very ambitious goal with, using the same strategies. So they fixate on building a strong team. They're just obsessed with recruiting and developing their teachers and school staff. <laughs> they go about building a, a kind of powerful culture that aligns everyone around this mission in a very intentional way. Um, they manage aggressively and they do whatever it takes. They take as a given only the goal and so when they realize I don't have enough time, they lengthen the school day. When they realize we need more supports or services or resources, they go out and get them. Um, so these schools are showing us that absolutely we can ensure, we, we really can provide kids who face extra challenges, whose socioeconomic background would predict one thing, with an education that actually changes their trajectory and there's, there's nothing elusive about it. So that's a massive development in the last 20 years because I think back to where we were 20 years ago um, when I first got into this and the prevailing notion backed up by all the research was that it wasn't possible. Socioeconomic background determined educational outcomes and now we have not just a few but literally hundreds of whole schools doing that. We have dozens of communities with growing numbers of schools that are showing us what is possible. So that's a massive reason for optimism right there. Like we know how to do something we didn't know 20 years ago. The question now, of course, is, you know, how do we scale that? How do we get to whole systems of transformational schools? Um, and to that question, I think there's, there's reason for pessimism and, and reason for optimism. The, the reason for pessimism is that in, in 20 years of billions of dollars of philanthropy and um, one committed political leader after another, we haven't moved the needle at all, as I'm sure you know, in an aggregate sense. 
we still have 15, we have more kids growing up in poverty now, 15 million kids, um, who by the time they're in fourth grade are at the first grade level compared to kids in, in high income communities. We all know this, half of our low income kids will graduate from high school and the half who do on average have an eighth grade skill level compared to kids in high income communities. So 8% of our low income kids are graduating from college by the time they're 26 compared with 80% of our top quartile um, kids in terms of income bracket. So that's, it's depressing that given all the energy and effort and all the broader education reform stuff that's going on, we haven't moved the needle against that. What I think is really encouraging and gives me incredible optimism is that some communities are moving the needle. So I, I think about communities that we had all given up on five or 10 years ago that are making a meaningful difference for kids. Um, New York City, I mean, we forget, and somehow there's still a lot of controversy about whether the New York reforms are real, but 10 years ago in New York, we had 32 community school district, school boards, making decisions. We had, every day you'd get up and you'd read the New York Times and just these inane arguments between mayors and chancellors about nothing related to the heart and soul of what you know creates transformational education. So, so much based on politics and patronage. I mean, there was no hope. I mean, the big debate was, can you ever change a system this big? And, and then, as we know, we had a mayor who came in and a chancellor who really rationalized the system and such. Fourth graders are performing a year ahead of where they were seven years ago in New York. The graduation rate has increased 20 points among African-American students. Still a long way to go. 60% of our African-American kids in New York are graduating uh, from high school, but it's a lot higher than 40%, which is where we were a mere like seven or eight years ago. So we are making progress in New York that is meaningful for kids. Um, New Orleans and Washington, D.C., everyone in and around those communities and nationally had thrown up their hand. No one thought we could change what was happening in those those communities, and yet we're seeing meaningful progress. In New Orleans, the percentage of kids who are proficient based on the state tests has doubled, which is a big, big, big progress in the last four years. This rate of change in, in New Orleans versus the rest of the state of Louisiana, which has actually been a pretty you know, decent state, good leadership and whatnot, um, uh, has quadrupled. So, so New Orleans kids are moving four times as fast as, as kids in the rest of the state in terms of, of improvement. Um, so what is different? Like what is different in these communities where they actually are moving the needle? And, and from everything I can tell, what's different is that in these communities, there is a constellation of leaders who are deeply grounded in the lessons that can be learned in these transformational schools. And so while, the, while many, many people who want to make a difference against this problem, who want to solve the problem tomorrow, and therefore are letting themselves just embrace one big idea after another, and bring us through the lurch of, from one silver bullet solution to another, the people in these communities know it is no one thing. And, and they know this is about, like when you spend time in these schools, you realize this is about leadership and people and it's about empowering our educators and giving them both the responsibility and the flexibility to pursue results that are not just incrementally better but are meaningfully better for kids. And so they've embraced the strategies around moving from a compliance culture to a more accountability-based culture and they've made a massive investment in their principles and, and their teaching force. Um, so this gives me lots of hope, and, and, um, and, and again, I, I just think there's huge reason for optimism. Like I actually think we have learned in the last 20 years that it is really possible to, to move the needle against this problem in, in a way that is really important for kids. The last thing I'll, I'll just share and, and then just open this up, um, and, and this is kind of what fuels our sense of urgency to grow Teach for America. Wherever you see progress, and I'm sure you know this through your own work, but wherever you see progress that is like, tr 
transformational for kids, like meaningful for them, not a couple percentage points better on a state test, but we're really putting kids on a different trajectory wherever you see it. If it's at the classroom level, the school level, the system level, always this is about leadership. Always, always. There's just never an exception. You know, every single Megan you've ever met is an unbelievable leader who deeply believes in her kids and as a result is going to do whatever it takes and will act boldly in, on their behalf. I have never, ever, in all of this time, I've probably been in a hundred of these transformational schools or maybe more, ever found one that wasn't run by someone who has rare leadership qualities, a rare level of conviction in the potential of their kids, and as a result is just going to make it happen. And now I, what I'm also realizing is that at the system level as well, always, there's a constellation of leaders, and not only inside the system, but political leaders, union leaders, other teachers within the union, advocates in the community who share these same convictions, who based on their own experiences have real reason to believe that kid, our urban and rural kids can achieve at high levels, have a grounded understanding of what it's going to take in order to enable that to happen because they've spent time in and around either these transformational classrooms or transformational schools, and as a result sort of know what to do and are willing to take the bold steps. And what we've seen over time is that more often than not, these leaders have themselves learned the lessons that come from having taught transformationally. So that is what fuels us in this, is to say we want every additional leader out there we can find, like people with future leadership capability to channel their energy in this direction. We want to invest as much as we can in them to try to help support them to be those transformational teachers, both for the sake of their kids and for the sake of the lessons they'll learn. Um, and, and then we want to do everything we can to support and foster their ongoing kind of leadership in this. So, so that's kind of, that's, that's what fuels us, us in, in what we do. Um, so with that, why don't I just open this up and I'd love to hear kind of, I don't know, what's on your minds. So we, I'm actually, I have two parts. One is I'd be curious to hear if you unpack a little bit of the compliance versus accountability as like a key piece of the shift. But also you're saying that basically the answer is quality leaders, right? <laughs> so I'm wondering as you've traveled the country and gone to all these different places, seen all these leaders, what are sort of a few of the characteristics or traits that those leaders have that share? Like, you know, North Star versus KIPP are very different cultures. So it's not about the kind of culture that it's about establishing a culture. So as, as we are trying to be great leaders in our school, sort of like, guess, what are the you know, things we should really focus on to help ourselves when there's so many things we're trying to do? Yeah. Um, and again, I mean, I should have caveated this whole thing by just acknowledging that truly, I, I sort of realize many of you have far more experience in these same questions than, than I do, but one additional perspective. Um, um, so compliance versus accountability, uh, you know, I just think it's very striking that wherever you see schools with truly like incredible results for kids, always there is a leader who either has been given or has just taken the flexibility to, I mean, they've embraced a different mission, like they have a level of personal like sense of responsibility for achieving a certain outcome and they are just going to do whatever it takes, no matter what anyone else tells them. So meaning especially over issues of who they hire and, and keep in their, in their buildings and how they spend their money. So there are just huge implications for that. Like, and, and to see what's happened in New Orleans, and I don't know if you all have visibility in, into what's happening down there, but have you, do, I mean, let me just quickly share this story because I think, I don't know, it, it's such an untold story and I feel like, gosh, I mean, the verdict is still out, of course, because they have a long way to go. But um, after the hurricane, you know, the school board decided they weren't going to open schools for a year and 
various people thought that wasn't acceptable, so the state took over the, over the schools. And actually, I mean, people think, oh, well, the hurricane and then, but really there was a group of people who had been in and around this whole thing and advocating for certain reforms who sort of saw that as a window of opportunity and essentially said, okay, we are taking the schools away from the New Orleans School Board. We are going to create a whole new world where we're going to phase out the old district and we're going to have basically a system of charters. But the regular system, this is just the regular system now. Any one can apply to run a school. We are going to have, they set up very high standards for selecting the people who ran those schools. And we are going to shut them down if they don't work. Um, but because these particular people had been around the block so many times, unlike in other places where people just assume, once you do that, of course, everything else works out because you've got the market and every, you know, they were under no illusion. They know you can't just like, you know, who's going to run these schools? Who's going to do this? And so they put a massive, massive nationwide and local effort into recruiting the people they wanted to run these schools. And um, so it's, it, to go to New Orleans, and, and you know, we've been placing there since year one, so I have been walking around schools in New Orleans for 20 some years, and I still remember walking around the old world in New Orleans. It was so devastating, right? And we were consistently seeing eighth graders on the second or third grade level, consistently, with no seeming energy to change that in any buildings that we would go in. Not that, you know, again, well, I'm gonna get to this. So, now, you go to New Orleans and it's just a shocking experience. I went there in the process of writing this book a year ago and just went there again and saw even more of the same. But I spent two days walking from school to school to school, not just a KIPP school, not just a whatever school that we've all heard of, but just from school to school to school and felt like I would put my kids in any one of these schools because there are a bunch of committed educators running around saying, what more can we do to move our kids forward? It's just like a different world. Now, I had pulled together a group of our few dozen of our alums who we placed there over the years to try to understand what was happening in New Orleans. And two things stood out that gave me, like, this is what really fuels my optimism. So two of the comments. One woman says, I want you to know I just bought a house. And, you know, she was basically saying, I was assigned here by Teach for America to teach for two years. Then I fell in love with the city one more year. I mean, the classic Teach for America story. Then one more year, but this was never going to be home. She's like, you know what I realized? This is home. And in explaining why, she said, I am the hot commodity in New Orleans. Everyone wants me to teach in their schools. I can choose the school I want to teach in, the culture I want to be a part of, the mission I want to be a part of. And you know what? They pay me decently because these principals can decide how to spend their money believe it or not. So they're deciding what to compensate their teachers. So that was one fascinating thing. The other was to hear them say, don't get the story wrong. Like, don't think this is a bunch of outsiders coming in to save New Orleans. They're like, the good people came out of the system. And this led to this incredible discussion where people were just talking about the impact of changing the rules. Like, where for so many years, people who came into this for all the right reasons were kind of working in the culture that had grown up and, and really sort of, you know, it's, it's a very rare person who overcomes their culture. So, you know, they're thinking their job really is to tick the boxes. And all of a sudden, there really are no more boxes. And the key is we got to keep the building open. And all of a sudden, they said, you know, not everyone made the transition, obviously, but some people did. And, you know, a number of the principals and teachers who are doing so well, you know, we just needed to create a different culture to bring that out. So that, that, that I thought was just encouraging. I know you asked a whole other question here, which is, I mean, I think, you know, we, we think that, um, I mean, there's a set of personal characteristics that we do lots of research at Teach for America to try to understand what, what are the personal characteristics that you can see at the front end that predict success. And, you know, there are certain personal characteristics that really do differentiate folks. Perseverance, the ability to influence and motivate others. I mean, clearly, we're looking at teachers. Um, but it is still interesting that the characteristics that have shown to have measurable impact are 
things that are basically leadership qualities. Perseverance, the ability to influence and motivate others, um, problem solving ability, organizational ability. We look for a set of things around fit with this mission, desire to work relentlessly, high expectations for kids, ability to work with respect and humility. Um, but what we've seen over time is that it's, it's, you know, there's an approach that, and we've learned this from our very best of the best people, you know, like the approach that works with kids in this context. And I think similarly, you know, I actually see incredible similarities. Of course there are differences across KIPP and Uncommon and Achievement First and any number of other schools, but there are incredible, incredible themes. And, and I mean, it, this is all very generic and I sort of said it earlier, but they truly embrace a different mission than most people embrace. Like they just commit themselves. They have a real vision of a different trajectory for their kids and have a very clear idea of what they what their kids need to be able to do um, in order to have that in their lives. Like they have very clear academic achievement and usually some semblance of character goals for their kids. And um, every single, in fact, I, I went to so many schools as I, as I was writing this book and to a person, I mean, without any exception, when I asked these principals what they thought accounted for the success, every single person said people number one. Like, they are literally, I mean, you know, they're just thinking constantly, who can I recruit into my building? They're meeting with them every week. They're in their classrooms constantly. They view their fundamental job as recruiting and developing their teachers. Um, every single one of them thinks so intentionally about culture. Like, they create culture plans with their teachers around everything we need to do, like what culture do we aspire to create and what are we gonna do from step one to build that culture? Like they think so carefully about how to build a culture that, that aligns everyone on, on the same path. Um, they manage, you know, I mean, it's so interesting to think about, I mean, they're sitting down with their teachers every week just like any manager would sit down with their people every week. Not even just about their teaching, but you know, to find out their challenges, talk about, you know, whatever's going on in their lives. Like, you know, they really, they, they manage aggressively. And then they, they are willing to do, I mean, they have such an internal locus of control around, and they grow it. <laughs> you know, like, we can control everything, you know, and, and we're going to need to in order to reach this, this goal. Other... So I appreciate you being here. Thanks for, for coming and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. I'm interested in the book, although should I read the book now? I feel like uh, you probably gave us the whole synopsis. Not sure. So my question is this. It's, it's around leadership, right? We have uh, those networks you were talking about that have a teacher you at Hunter College, right? And they're growing that idea. I'm interested in knowing about other places around the country that are successfully training leaders, principals, teacher, yeah. teacher leaders to do this kind of work, right? I think one of the things that I'm, I've struggled with is to find a nice match. It's great to be here with this group of really thoughtful, dedicated principals from different sectors here in the Boston area, digging into good work with BC. Does this exist in other places? Are folks doing this on a, on a master's degree level, ed, you know, a, a, a doctorate yeah. of education level? Is this happening in other places? Do you recommend us looking into you know, specific you know, agencies that are doing this kind of work? I mean, uh, I think we have a long way to go in terms of, you know, the kind of principal development efforts that, that we really need. Um, you know, my husband runs the KIPP network, so I mean, there's a bit of, but, but the Fisher Fellowship, which, you know, is training hundreds, some, not only KIPP school leaders, but they're training the, many of the other network leaders as well. I mean, they, I, I hear, I mean, I spent last night, it was with a guy who actually is in Teach for India and is in this program to go back and start a, he wants to start a network of 100 high performing schools in India. It's, it's just so exceptional. But to hear him talk about this, you can tell, I mean, they have brilliant people who've refined and refined and refined a true leadership development program for, for principals. I mean, I think that's gotta be one of the best out there. New Leaders has, has done a lot. I think they would say they're still on the learning curve of how do we become truly 
exceptional at this, but they've learned a lot. Teach for America has partnerships with lots of institutions, you know, to try to streamline the path to the principalship and create three to five year paths. Um, and, and I think we would say that we're struggling to find enough that, that our folks would truly swear by. Um, but we do have a number of innovative partnerships with schools of ed, districts that streamline the path into the principalship. Um, it just seems that we have much further to go to really, you know, ensure the effectiveness of the principles we're ultimately placing.